All right, everybody. Um, thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's competition. So uh, a number of our judges uh, proposed having this idea this year of doing a problem review since we're all online anyways. Um, normally, this is not something we could do on our on-site contest because it would be a long day and a lot of teams have to travel multiple hours back to their homes. Uh, but this year we can do this. And so uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, one of our judges, Jacob Steinbron, who will kick it off and they'll go through each problem and he'll, he'll introduce uh, the other judges as we go. So take it away, Jacob. Hello. Can sorry about that. I couldn't uh, unmute myself. All right. So yeah, um, this is something that we prepared the problem review because um, something that we've learned over experience is that the best way to improve your skill is to not only compete but also to solve the problems that you didn't solve during contest because um, that's where you really learn what you don't know. Because if you only solve the problems that you do know, then you're not going to get any better. So um, so first, uh, we've got some st stats about the solves. So the total number of submissions you guys uh, collectively was over 1,000. So it was 1,098. Um, and on average, it took about one, oop, oh goodness. And on average, it took about uh, one minute to ju judge each of these submissions. Um, so we had, in fact, we had one submission that was solved or that was judged uh, zero minutes after it was submitted. And we have one submission that was judged 21 minutes after it was submitted. But the reason for that is because there was one problem whose Python time limit was 20 minutes. Um, so that's most of that time is just running the code and not actually taking time to produce the result. And the standard deviation um, is 7.3 minutes. And per language, uh, you can see no one submitted in C. There were 119 submissions in C++, 757 in Java, and 212 in Python. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Josh. So he will talk about the uh, problem build a house. Hello. So, my problem, as, a, as Jacob just mentioned, is that I'll be covering build a house. So, a total of 83 teams managed to solve it, which is pretty great. And there are 107 different submissions on it. So, uh, next slide, please. So since a lot of you um, may not have, since the problem set this year was actually really long, we'll give a small description in case if you didn't get to get around to actually reading the problem. So for this problem, Bob the Builder is trying to build a house as shown by the blueprint on the right. So the question is, given the side length of a single side, we're trying to find the length of the outer perimeter. So the solution to this is that from the right, we can see that there's five different lengths or five different sides, each of the same length. So the solution is to multiply the input length by five. However, there's a few uh, tricky things. And one thing is to make sure you don't multiply by six since we want the outer limit, outer perimeter, and we don't want to include the middle segment. And I'll be also covering the problem no more. This time we had 79 teams manage to solve it with 117 submissions. So again, with the um, problem statement, for this problem, we're trying to remove the letter um, E from the inputted string. This is because Derek has managed to um, outlaw the letter E, and thus the title was called No More Without an E. So we, the solution is to read each line or each input line by line and not word by word and remove the letter E. So for some examples of how to do this in different languages in C++, you can use regex replace, or regex underscore replace to replace um, a regular expression with, a, with a, a blank, effectively deleting all the E's. With Java, you can do replace all to replace all the E's with blanks. And in Python, you can also do the same, same with just replace. Alternatively, if you didn't want to use one of their out of the box methods, you can just print the string character by character, unless the character is equal to E. So you just skip E. And make sure, and one more tricky thing is you have to make sure that you print every line or every single chain string on its own line. Because otherwise, you just have a, a, you'll output like a single line with every single answer on the same line. So now that I'm done, I'll be handing it off to Southwick, who will cover Intercell and Melon. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so there were 80 correct submissions out of uh, 92 total attempts. Okay, so uh, the, short, the short version of the problem is um, 
We want to travel from Earth located at point zero zero to the mountain's point in the input uh, x, y, and back. So according to the problem, we can't move diagonally, only parallel to either the x or y axis, and which means like right, left, up, or down. And, and it turns out we can just uh, find these uh, differences in x coordinates and y coordinates separately and add them together to find the total distance. So we can derive this formula that total distance is equal to um, x2 minus x1 plus y2 minus y1. And this is actually known as the Manhattan distance between two points. Since the Earth is located at the origin, the total distance ends up being x plus y. And you have to be careful to uh, look at uh, read the problem carefully. And it's asking for uh, the round trip. So we can just multiply our answer by 2 and print it out. And next uh, will be Fiona covering worst code. So worst code had 77 solutions and 101 total submissions. Um, and the problem was given a word written in worst code, you want to translate it to plain text. So they give you the translation in the problem statement. And the solution is to use ASCII, which basically means that for every string, um, we can obtain a distance from the letter A using the length of the string minus one, the string being like the sequence of dots. So you would want to read in the line and then take each sequence of dots separated by spaces, find the length, and add that length minus one to the character A to get the resulting character. And you want to print each character in um, its like respective line, making sure not to print a new line for each character. Um, and that's the solution to worse. And uh, Hi everyone, my name is Sharon. I will be covering expectations. Okay, in this problem, you are given an array of integers and you must increase values in order um, to be left with an array that is increasing. At the end, you have to print how much you increased each value by in total. So since each value uh, must be larger than the value before it, you know, uh, a of i has to be greater than a of i minus one. So we can add the least amount necessary, which is uh, the difference between them, if that rule is not already does not already exist. One issue we saw a lot of teams have is that the answer needs to be stored in a long, which is a 64-bit integer. If you're just using an integer, like in int, uh, you will not have enough space in your answer and it will overflow, uh, which would print incorrect answers for some cases. So co covering our algorithm in this example, you can see our array, 4288. Uh, First index we don't need to change. We look at the second index and two is less than four. So we add three to make it five. We look at the third index, uh, eight is already greater than five. We don't need to do anything. We look at the fourth index um, and it's not greater than eight. So we need to add one to make it greater. And in total, we've changed four things. So that's it for this problem. Oh, okay, we've added the slide. I, I did not realize we added the slide. Okay, that's good. Um, right, so this is what I explained before. Uh, the value that you add could be very large, which overflows an integer. So you can use long, long for C++, long for Java. Oh, in Python, you don't actually need to worry about it because Python integers have a dynamic size. All right, passing it on to Southwick for Max String. There were 31 total uh, correct submissions out of 90 uh, total submissions. Uh, so the problem was basically um, given a string S, find the max string, and which is basically the minimum string X, such that X is not a substring of S. So the, the claim is that the length of the max string will be at most length two. Uh, and the proof behind that is uh, we can find the lower bound for the length of string S if we want our X to be uh, length three. 
we can construct the string s such that every two adjacent characters will form all unique all unique strings of length two, and then our x will have to be length three. So if we do this, they, we can notice that there are 26 squared uh, unique strings of length two that can be achieved with a minimum uh, string s of length 26 squared minus one, which equals 675. And if you notice from the bounds, uh, we only give you a string of up to 500. And so, since 675 is greater than 500, we are guaranteed to have a max string of either length one or length two. So now, uh, now we know we can just check uh, all max strings of length one or and length length two, and we can just brute force them. And this problem uh, can be implemented really cleanly and quickly if you know the contains function for your language, like uh, s dot contains x in Java. So first, we want to check all strings of length one, and so we can just loop through all the letters in order from a to z. And if you find that one of these letters is not contained within s, we can just print it out as your answer. And if all the letters are contained within S, then we know that our answer has to be of a max string of length two. And so um, we can go uh, first in our outer loop from A to Z, then our inner loop also from A to Z. And we can let our current max string equal to uh, our outer loop letter plus our inner loop letter. Uh, and we can, we can get a string out of that. And then we just check if X is not contained within the string S. And if it isn't, then we can just print it out as our answer. And next will be Sharon covering DVD. All right. And DVD was solved by 28 teams out of 49 attempts. So DVD, we can start by simplifying. Uh, pretend the DVD logo is one by one if we just subtract the height of the window by the height of the logo and the width of the window by the width of the logo. This just makes it a little bit easier, so I would recommend it. Then you can just simulate you maintain the logo's position start at the top left corner and whether it moves in a positive x direction or a positive y direction on every move. Uh, when, the when the logo hits a vertical wa wall, it changes the x direction. When it hits a horizontal wall, it changes the y direction. If it hits both walls at the same time, we're done. That is a corner. And the checks that we need to do is if the position of x is equal to 0, if the position of x is equal to width, or the position of y is equal to 0 and position y is equal to height. Those are the positions of the walls. Uh, moving on to Jacob for blob. All right, so for a blob, uh, 24 teams solved it out of 81 submissions. So in the problem, you're given a list of collisions in the game blob tag, and you need to print the size of the largest group after all the collisions. Uh, most two connections because they have two hands. So we only need to keep uh, two arrays, uh, each of size n, where each value is initialized to negative one. And uh, these are going to hold which child is connected to this child. Um, so for some index i. And for each collision, we're going to make sure that both of the children that are involved in the collision have a space to connect. Um, and we can just check if there's a negative one in both of their arrays. And if they do, we can mark the new connection in each of their respective arrays. And so now, after all the collisions have been processed, for each child, we need to determine the size of the blob they're in. And so to do that, um, we're going to keep some Boolean array of which children you've already processed. And to process a child, all you need to do is you need to add their neighbors to some queue, which is a data structure that you can find implemented in your language. And you can mark those people as processed. Then you can consider the person you're looking at the leader of the group. Uh, you can start a counter size for this leader at 1. Um, and while the queue is not empty, you're going to pick some person off of the queue and mark them as processed and add all of their unprocessed neighbors to the queue and then add one to the group size. Um, and once the queue becomes empty, that means that everyone in the leaders group will have been processed and marked and you will know the size of the leaders group. And you should only designate a child to be the leader of a group if they're not processed, because if they are processed, that means some other leader already, already handled them. So once all the children have been processed, you just need to take the max of the group sizes, and that'll be your answer. So you could either store them in an array uh, and then take the max at the end, or just keep a running max as you process the leaders. Um, and you notice that since you only ever added any one person to the queue once, because you don't add processed people, everyone was processed just one time. So the total time complexity is going to be order n, which means linear, where n is the number of children. 
All right, so now we've got Daniel for triangles. Thanks, Jacob. So yeah, triangles was a bit of a tricky problem. There were 14 solves and 55 submissions. So the main idea behind triangles is you're given a bunch of side lengths and you want to count the number of ways you can pick three of them such that they form um, a triangle of, a, of three specific types, right, obtuse, and acute. And so while we can make some observations, um, the right triangles can be solved using Pythagorean theorem. So that's the a squared plus b squared equals c squared. This is true for all right triangles, um, assuming that you have your a, b, and c sorted. For the others, we can use the same logic as well. Um, so for acute triangles, we can use the same formula and assume that c squared is going to be less than the sum of a squared plus b squared. And the logic for this is, well, the hypotenuse would, would be too short for the triangle to be right, so it must be acute. Um, same for the obtuse, where c squared is just larger than the sum of a squared plus b squared, the hypotenuse is too long. So the other thing we have to keep track of is that, well, it has to be a valid triangle in the first place. So the two smaller side lengths, the, that sum must be greater than the third side length for it to be a valid triangle. Um, so I think a lot of teams made this observation. The issue was counting these triples efficiently. So rather than brute forcing both or all three side lengths at the same time, so you know you could brute force A, then B, then C, um, we can brute force A and B and then pick values of C based on the values of A and B, and try and count the number of C's without actually enumerating them. Um, and so we can do that by defining ranges for values of C that are going to work for each different type. So for acute triangles, we can say, okay, well, C must be bigger than B for it to obey the, you know, the hypotenuse. And then also has to be less than the square root for it to be acute. And so we, we define our range as b to the square root of that sum. And those are exclusive ranges. Same goes for right, except we must, well, c must be equal. So our range is quite simple. It's just the square root to the square root. And then for obtuse, well, we have to make sure that it doesn't go past or equal to the sum of a plus b but it also must be greater than the square root. Otherwise it would not be right. So we can define another range for this obtuse, um, an exclusive range. So yeah, um, a little note. I, I put square roots for the ranges, but it could be a little easier to make these ranges, um, the squared versions of the ranges where you square both the left and the right of the range. Um, that way you don't have to deal with any messy square root stuff. So to find the number of C's that actually exist in, in these ranges, we can take our input and um, sort our array and then use prefix sums to find these ranges efficiently. Um, so prefix sums is a whole topic of its own. I won't cover it now. Um, it's easily Googleable. So I would recommend learning about that and then try and implement this. So our total runtime is n squared, where we brute force a and b, and then try and find the number of c's in order one. And I will hand it back to Jacob Steinbrunn. All right, so um, for Spider-Man, uh, we've got nine, pe nine teams that solved it out of uh, 31 submissions. Um, and so for this problem, you need to check if removing one edge, uh, any edge, is able to disconnect nodes 1 and n. And you get to pick the edge. 
Um, so to do this, uh, we can just iterate over which edge we want to remove, because there's at most 1,000 of the edges, as given by the, the bounds of the input. Uh, and so for each iteration, you can use a graph traversal algorithm. So you, uh, DFS and BFS are good candidates. Um, and so to do this, you are going to start at node 1 and run your DFS or your BFS. And after you're done, you're going to see if node n is visited by the end. Um, and each iteration uh, of the edge you're going to remove, you just need to make sure that you don't use that edge. So pretend it doesn't exist or like don't traverse it. And that's it. So I'm going to hand it back to Daniel for Nightwatch. Thanks, Jacob. Um, so this problem had six solves and 29 submissions. So the gist of Nightwatch is that um, pretend you're a person centered at 0, 0 on this 2D plane, and you have a bunch of points around you, and you have a field of view that's only 90 degrees wide. And you can position that field of view um, in whatever way you want, as long as it's centered at zero, zero. And you're trying to see as many points as possible inside of this field of view. So it seems a little tricky at first, uh, but we can realize that there's only a finite number of different fields of view we'll have to check. So in the example drawn out here, we can see that, okay, well, we could capture these three points using this field of view where it's, you know, pretty centered. Um, but an equivalent field of view that captures the same points can just be rotated slightly until the edge of the field of view is touching one of the points. So this means that we can check fields of views. We only have to check fields of views where one of the edges touches one of the points. Uh, next slide, please. So we can analyze exactly n different fields of views. Um, yeah, so each we can define each field of view by the point with the smallest angle. So it's kind of a weird way of saying like, okay, the guy farthest on your right of the field of view, we can define each field of view by that guy. Um, and we'll brute force which guy is going to be the farthest on our right. Um, and so we'll call that angle theta. Um, that angle is referring to its unit circle angle. And so that what that means is that, okay, to, to count the number of points inside this defined field of view, well, we can just count the number of points that lie inside the range of angles from theta to theta plus 90 degrees. Um, and yeah, so, so we can look through every other point in the array and see if it falls inside this range. And we'll take a count and we'll count for each field of view. And then of those, we'll take the largest one. So this ends up being an n squared algorithm we have n different fields to analyze. And for each field, we do an order n sweep through our array. And so that gives us an order n squared algorithm. So I'll hand it back to Jacob Steinebron to go over Octopus Garden. Well, I thank you, Daniel. All right, so for Octopus Garden, uh, there was one solve out of five submissions. Um, and so for this problem, you're given uh, an array and you need to determine the minimum number of cyclic subarray rotations by one that you need to sort the array. Um, and it's important that the array values are distinct because that means um, you don't have issues where you have two values that could be in two different locations once it's once you're finished. Um, and so the idea of a minimum or a, a cyclic subarray rotation by one that's uh, a little bit um, strange. So we can reduce that operation. Um, we can show that that's equivalent to another operation. Um, so because you get to choose the start and end and direction of the shift, you can actually prove that the operation is equivalent to just moving one element anywhere you want in the array. And so we can see why this is. So for example, if we have the array uh, that's shown here and you want to move the two in between the nine and the one, you can choose a cyclic subarray shift by one 
um, which is the one shown here. So you're going to choose the subarray 249 and shift it to the left. And what you'll see is that 2 is going to be like rotated all the way back to the end of the, the subarray that you chose. And uh, equivalently, if you have a, a cyclic subarray shift, which is 249, and you shift it to the right, you can show that there is a transposition, which is the 2 moving between the 9 and the 1, that is equivalent to that. Um, and so because you can go both ways, um, these operations are equal. So you can use them interchangeably. Um, so we can use that in our proof idea. So, excuse me. So um, we, you never want to transpose every any any one element more than once because let's say you moved it from index i where it started to j and then to k. You could have just done i to k and like taking into account uh, moves uh, that kind of happened between those first tr or those two transpositions. Um, so because you never want to move any element more than once, you know that the maximum your answer could ever possibly be is n, because you could imagine just moving them all one time, and then they'd be finished. Um, actually, you can do better than that. You can do n minus 1, because you can just pick some element, it doesn't matter what, and just say, don't move him, and, and move everything else around that, that element. Um, actually, you can almost always do better than that. So let's say that there's some i, like some pair i and j, those are indices, such that i is less than j, and the array at i is less than the array at j. That means that the upper bound is actually n minus 2, because you can choose to not move the elements at i and j and move the rest around them. Um, and you know you won't have to move i or j because they're relatively sorted. So if everything else is going to move anyway, they may as well move into their correct spots, and then i and j can stay fixed. So that's like n minus 2, because you didn't move two elements. So if you keep going with this idea, then the best you can do to sort the array is choose some longest increasing subsequence and fix those in place and move everything else. Um, and so a subsequence is just a, a subset of the array in increasing order or in increasing order of appearance. And then you want the uh, the subsequence that you choose to be increasing. So as the subsequence goes from left to right, the values go from low to high. And so the answer is just going to be n minus the length of the longest increasing subsequence. And so we can see an example of this. Um, but to compute the LIS, you're just going to use some technique you could Google. Um, so here we, got, we have an example. So for this array, we're going to find some LIS. And uh, we found 246 here. You could have also found 249, but um, either way, it works. And so then once we found our LIS, we're going to move everything other than the LIS. So we need to move the 5. And so you see, we transpose the five um, between the four and the six. And it doesn't matter where re with respect to the other ones, because they're going to be moved anyway. And now we're going to move the nine. And so the nine goes after the six. And then we're going to move the one. And the one goes before the two. And then what you've noticed is that we're done. We're sorted. And we didn't move the two, four, and six. We moved everything else. Um, and since in this problem, you only have to print the number of moves you make. You don't have to prove which moves you make. So you only care about the length of the LIS. All right. So I'm going to give a turn, turn over to Fiona for Knapsack. Thank you. Uh, so Knapsack had one solution out of 72 submissions. So it's quite the popular problem. Um, basically, what Knapsack is, is that we've finished a raid, and now we have to pick up loot. And every item has a weight and a value. So we have a maximum capacity that we can carry we want to know what the maximum value we can collect is given that we don't exceed our capacity. So one thing that a lot of people tried is a greedy approach. And there were two really common greedies. The first is to try to take the items with the greatest value. And if they're the same, then take the ones with the smallest weight. This doesn't work because if you consider capacity of 10 and this array of items below um, where the value is next to the weight, you would see that if we take the six, we can't take anything else because that has a weight of six. If we don't take it, then we can take the four and the three for a total value of seven and a total weight of 10. So that shows that taking the two latter things is actually better than taking the first thing. Similarly, the second greedy says that we should take the items with the, with the best value to weight ratio. But if you consider the same array, we come up with the same outcome. We would still take the six first, leading to a less than optimal solution. 
The next approach that people tried is the dynamic programming concept called a knapsack DP, which is funny because it's the problem's namesake. Um, but in a regular knapsack DP, we would want to answer the question, from my current index and remaining capacity, what is the maximum value that I can reach? And then at each index, we can either take the item and therefore carry the weight and gain the value, or leave the item and move on, which is why it's also called a take it or leave it DP. But turns out that you can't use a knapsack DP. If you tried this, you might have seen a runtime error or time limit exceeded, and here's why. It would require us to create a memo table of size 10 to the ninth. The state would be the index times the capacity, which is 1,000 items times a maximum capacity of 10 to the sixth. So we have to start making some observations. First, what if our capacity is greater than the total sum of all of our items' weights? We would obviously just want to take all of our items because we can. But what if the total sum of weights is greater than the capacity? Then our question, instead of what's the max value without exceeding capacity, would then become what's the minimum value I need to get rid of to meet my capacity requirements. So basically, what kind, how many items do I have to drop? And what's the minimum value that it would take to drop these items? So the bounds become much better for this problem. We now have a memo state of size five times 10 to the sixth, or uh, sorry, five times 10 to the seventh. So we would still need to keep track of what index we're at, which is 1,000. But instead of a remaining capacity, we would have to keep track of our remaining amount to drop. So that comes from the maximum total weight possible, which is 1,000 times the max weight of a single item, which is 1,050. So it's about 10 to the sixth, minus the minimum possible capacity that the input could give us, which is about 9 times 10 to the fifth, leading to 55,000 being the maximum amount that we could possibly need to drop. So that memoized with our index is about that five times 10 to the seventh state. We then do what I like to call a drop it or keep a DP, which is not very popular. Um, <laughs> at each index, we can either drop the current item that we're considering and subtract the amount of weight from what we need to drop remaining and add the value to the total amount that we lose, or we can keep that index suffering no consequence. So then we can memoize the minimum answer from dropping and keeping and subtract it from the total value of all of our items. And that's our answer. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Josh for pizza. All right. So Glenn and Glenn's pizza. There's actually one entire um, solution uh, throughout all the teams and there are 13 submissions. So to get into it, Glenn and Glenn's pizza. Um, it's a small disclaimer. Glenn actually did not write this problem. Um, Glenn and Glenn's pizza's um, problem is that you have a bunch of people and they all hate like um, specific toppings and you're trying to make choose toppings so that you can force as many people to not like your pizza and therefore hate your pizza because you're trying to greedily keep it all for yourself and not share with anyone. So um, although there are 50,000 toppings you can choose from, there are actually a few observations that can simplify the problem. So the first observation is the fact that if you have enough toppings you can choose, um, you can just simply choose a topping per person and make them and guarantee that that one person will hit the pizza. So if K is greater than or equal to N, then you can uh, guarantee that you share with absolutely no one. So um, on the table on the right, you can see that there are four different people. So if you just simply choose a an ingredient or a topping from every single row, you can guarantee that every single person that hates your pizza. So this is one of the easier cases. So if K is greater than or equal to N, you just output zero. So now we have to worry about the when k is less than less than n. So observation two is that some ingredients are actually identical because they cover the exact same people. So on the right, you can see that a and b um, both cover person one and person three. They both make person one and three hate the pizza. So if you ever take a, you never have to take b because they are essentially the same thing. So continuing on with observation two, um, instead of like ingredients ingredient categories. So continuing, we can see we can convert um, the left table to the right table. The left is like the input data and the right table is like the um, ingredients per um, and the people who hate them. So uh, continuing on with observation two, um, we also have the fact that there's at most two to the end of these categories and ingredients um, because um, if the next bullet, we can see that Every person can either like 
or hate sobbing. And so that means that this is of like two of two different choices for every person. So two times two times two for all n people means two to the n unique categories. So we can see from this, we have two to the n categories. And since n is less than or greater than 10, we have a thousand different ingredient categories. And therefore, um, we went from 50,000 ingredients down to 1,000 ingredients, which is a lot more manageable, which we'll get on to um, the next um, later. So with observation three, it seems like you'll naturally want to choose the ingredient categories that cause the most people to hate your pizza. So if pineapple happens to be very unpopular, you just want to choose it. So for example, if an ingredient, pineapple, uh, ingredient category makes four people hate your pizza, and there's an ingredient category that makes only three people hate your pizza, you'd seemingly always want to choose something that makes four people hate your pizza instead of just, the, instead of just three. However, we'll find that this greedy approach doesn't actually work as shown in the test case in the next slide. So for this test case, we're going to say there's six different people, and you can choose up to two toppings. So you can't choose A, B, and C. You can only do, choose up to two of them. So you can make, um, you can see that can make everyone hate your pizza by choosing A and B. So A covers one through three, and B covers people uh, four through six. So from this, we can see that if you choose like optimally, you can just do A and B and choose everyone. However, if you really base it based on uh, if you really choose based on how many people hate an ingredient, then you choose C because C covers two through five. Or, or in other words, C covers four people and makes four people hate your pizza, while A and B only cover three people. So you'd seemingly always want to choose four instead of three. But for this um, test case, you can see if you choose C first, then you remain, you're left with person one and person six liking your pizza. And you can only choose to make either one or six hate your pizza by choosing A or B. So therefore, you'll only get a you'll only make five people who eat your pizza and you'll be sharing with one person, which is bad. Because if you make, if you choose A and B, you make everyone hate your pizza, which is just better. So therefore the greedy approach does not work. So just as a small recap, observation one, if you can choose enough pizzas, you're good. So now we only have to worry if, you can, if your top number of toppings you can choose, okay, is less than equal to the number of people or N. Observation two is that you only have two to the N different topping categories, uh, or only a thousand. And observation three is that the greedy doesn't work. So what does work? Dynamic programming. So here's the solution idea for the dynamic programming. Um, we have the state, which consists of two things we have to keep track of, how many toppings we've taken so far, um, K, and what people currently hate a pizza so far. So the reason, which is two to the N. The reason for this being two to the N is that we can store this as a sequence of N bits, where zero means this person doesn't hate the pizza, and one means the person does hate the pizza. As there are n bits that are either zero or one, each bit has a decision of size two. So it's just two times two times two, dot, 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 up to um, n times, so two to the n. So there's two to the n possible combinations of people that currently hate our pizza. So the number of states totally in total is k times two to the n different states. And since k is less than or equal to 10, or strict, yeah, k is strictly less than n, which is 10. So k is at most nine. And the number of different states is at most two to the 10, uh, so 1,024. So this is relatively small. And now we have one more thing where um, the transition of the uh, DP, I apologize for this low transition. Um, for each topping type, we'll just either take this topping or, pay, or just skip it. So if you do take the topping, then you have to see the effect of this topping on like who hates the pizza by using the binary or operation. So since we're storing this as like a sequence of bits, we have some, a really neat trick where normally um, you can like individually do like if previously person one didn't like the pizza and now person one and this new topping makes person one hates the pizza and now it's um, they hate it. You can use the binary or operations to do all these bits at the same time, which is super, it's a nice speed up and the code is like nice and short for this. So if we store it, oh uh, yeah, that's fine. So now after this, we'll have Sharon, who will cover molecular mole. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're moving on to the harder problems in the set, uh, problems nobody solved, but some people may have attempted. I'll do my best to explain it to you as concisely as possible. This one uh, is not too bad. Uh, the main observation is that when two moles, oh, sorry, if, if you haven't read the problem, um, 
then what are you doing? You should read all the problems. But if you haven't read the problem, uh, then uh, in this problem, we want to count the number of times uh, two molecules collide and each molecule has a direction um, that they move in. So the main observation is after the moles collide, they swap the rays that represent the molecules. So you can see in the, in the picture, um, once A and B collide, A starts going in the direction B used to go and B starts going in the direction that A used to go. And this is all they collide. So the idea that we're gonna follow is we're going to compute all the collision points between the pairs of rays and sort them and then simulate. So computing collision points, there are two cases. The first case is where the rays are non-parallel. There is one intersection between the rays so the two moles collide at the intersection if they're equally distant to it because all the moles have the same speed. In the other case, the rays are parallel. Uh, in, if the rays are collinear and facing each other is the only time when a collision would happen between two moles. And the collision point is the midpoint between the two ray endpoints. So once we've computed the collision points, we sort them by the time in which they happen, which is equal to the distance. Uh, then we initialize index of i to be the mole represented by each ray of i. For each collision point, we maintain which two rays collide at this point. And then we just increment the answer for the two moles represented by the rays, and we swap the indices of the rays. And that should be it for this problem. I'm moving on to Road Trip. So Road Trip had zero solutions and three submissions. The problem was given a map of cities and the roads between them, what is the shortest length of an alphabetic road trip? And there are a few key details from the flavor text. First of all, what an alphabetic road trip is. It's a path that visits a city beginning with each letter of the alphabet up to J in alphabetical order. We can choose which cities we consider visited, or for example, we can pass through a city without counting it as a city on our trip. And we can start at any city that begins with an A and we're done as soon as we reach any city that begins with a J. So let's solve some subproblems. First, what if we only had to find the shortest distance from point A to point B with edge weights? We would use an algorithm called Dijkstra's, which uses a priority queue or min heap to find the shortest distance from one node to every other node in the graph. In short, it does this by keeping track of the current minimum path's current node and adding all of that node's edges to the priority queue with a new path weight. Now that we know how to find the shortest path between two nodes with edge weights, let's tackle the next subproblem. We need to know what letter of the alphabet we just visited so we can go to the next letter. Let's consider the most obvious option of brute forcing all possible pairs of A's to B's, then B's to C's, et cetera, until we get to J's, and use Dijkstra's to find the minimum path length between each pair. While this seems promising, our decisions have too many repercussions. For example, the minimum path from Alabama to Bermuda might be of length six, but the minimum path from Bermuda to Canada is length 100. Meanwhile, Alabama to Bahama is length 10, and from Bahama to Canada is length four. The answer here is clear. We'd want to go from Alabama to Bahama and then Bahama to Canada. And it shows how this kind of solution could get really complicated really fast, let alone considering the runtime, which is n squared or 10 to the 10th, plus a log factor because of the sorting in the priority queue. So that's a big oh no. So instead of trying to force our order, let's add a dimension to our Dijkstra's, which keeps track of what letter we last visited as well as our current node index. Then when we look at our current minimum path, we can always go to the next node with our current letter, for example, going through a city without visiting it. And if the city happens to begin with the next letter of the alphabet that comes after the one that we last visited, we can go to the next node, visit it, and update our current letter. This is called a split node Dijkstra's if you wanna Google it. And the runtime is the size of the state, which in this case is the alphabet size, times the index or 10 times 10 to the fifth, which is 10 to the sixth times a log factor to sort all of the edges coming in. So the last important note is to remember the fact that we can start at any city beginning with A. So we need to add all the cities that begin with A to our priority queue with a distance of zero before we start to make sure we consider all of our starting options. This is called a multi-source search. 
Likewise, at the end, we need to consider all possible cities starting with J that we could have ended at to ensure that we find our minimum answer. And with that, I'll go ahead and pass it on to Sharon for sausage. All right, so the final problem for tonight is Sharon sausages, uh, which I did not actually write, but I am featured in it. <laughs> uh, so in this problem, we want to, one way to think about it is counting subsequence of the form ABBA, um, where the A represents two things having the same uh, length and the B represents two things having the same length as well. So for each AB we find, how many BAs can we find to the right to match with is really what we want to compute. And then for each AB, we're going to multiply by the number of BAs and add it in. So one option is to brute force with four for loops, but that is a lot of operations. Your computer will probably not terminate within the time of the contest if you go this route. Uh, bound on the, each value is less than or equal to 100. And there are ways that we can use this to our advantage using some prefix sum and combinatorial ideas. So the first thing we want to do is keep next of i, the next index with the same value as index i, which is an array of size n. Uh, we can do this by storing the previous index of i when a value appears and setting next of the previous of i to equal to i. And let's keep count of ij. This is really the pair, how many pairs of ba we find in the suffix starting at i, uh, which we will use later to, to compute the abba sequences, where count of ij is counting how many bas are there after index i, where j is fixed like to be something between 0 and 100. So maintaining a frequency array for the suffix, for each position in the array, we're going to go back to front and we're setting the count of i, j to the frequency of j. Uh, this is the number of pairs um, where x is the element at i and how many j's come after it. Then we can out, add count of i, j, or we can add two count of i, j. We count, add count of next of i, j which is the next, the rest of the pairs that occur later on after this index i. Now going front to back, we've calculated all the BAs. So similar idea, calculating ABs from the front, maintaining a frequency array. And we're going to multiply the frequency by the count of next of i of j to get the number of quadruplets, where the second element is fixed to be the element as index i. So frequency of j is how many times j shows up before me. And count of next of i j is how many times does the pair uh, that's where the first element is equal to me and the next element is equal to j that shows up after me multiplying those two together and summing them across all i is our final answer. And our runtime is 100 times n, which is about 10 to the 7 operations, which is orders of magnitude better. I think that concludes our all our problems. All right. Well, thank you for your time. All right. Thanks to all the judges for doing this review. Great job. All right, well, thanks everyone. We'll see everybody next year.